homiletical outline of our key passage, which was Revelation, the 12th chapter, <clears throat> 7 through 12, which deals with the angelic conflict in eternity past and how it affects our life today. <clears throat> we discovered that in eternity past, by that I mean before the foundation of the world as we know it, Uh, there was an angelic rebellion in heaven, the third heaven, against Lucifer, an archangel, which is a Latin word, Lucifer, for what the Hebrews called uh, 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 a day star or a, a light, a star of light dawning. And... He led a revolt when God laid out his plan, uh, discussed a little bit in Ephesians 1, the first chapter of Ephesians. When God laid out the plan and showed that the centerpiece was going to be a Christ and the titles that he would be given and, and uh, what God's great plan was, uh, he was going to bring a human race into being. They would fall, and Christ would be the Son of God. Christ would become uh, the Savior of the world. Satan rebelled over that. Led a third of the angels with him. R Revelation 12, which we studied. <clears throat> Out of Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 26, 26, 28. 28, Ezekiel 28, those three passages, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, and Revelation 12. <clears throat> Revelation 12 gives you really a good interpretation of those other passages um, as that is the final book to close the Bible up on angelic and human history. See, what people miss about the angelic conflict that occurred in eternity past and how it affects the human race. What they miss is the connection between the fall of Satan and the fall of Adam and how they're connected all the way to judgment. And what is interesting is that in the end, the fallen angels and fallen mankind who ignore the gospel of Christ will go to the safe, same place in judgment. Did you hear what I just said? There is a connection between the fall of Satan and the fall of Adam that's connected to eternal judgment. And that is described in theology as the angelic conflict in the human race. So we're going to take a look at that. Okay. Before we have a word of prayer, open your Bibles to Revelation, the 20th chapter. Revelation, the 20th chapter. chapter. Look at verse 10. Revelation 20 chapter verse 10. The devil, that's one of the names of Lucifer after his fall. The devil who deceives those two words are connected. That's the word devil and the word deceive is where you get the concept and theology of cosmos diabolicus. The devil's rule over the world, like in 1 John 5, 19. 
go back to verse 10 with me. The devil who deceived them, talking about human race in his final days on earth, the human race in his final days on earth, that's the millennium up in verse 7, a thousand years, when a thousand years are completed. This is the end of the human race as we know it. This is where these two connections come, Satan and the fall of the angels to Adam, fall of man. This is where it comes down to after the days of the millennium. Verse 10, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are also, and they will be tormented day and night. Then we come to the human race, the great white throne judgment of the human race. I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence the earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. I saw the dead, great and small, stand before the throne. Books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. The sea gave up the dead which was in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, this lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, that is the Lamb's book of life of the blood of Christ. He was thrown into the lake of fire. <laughs> Do you see the connection? There's a connection between the fall of Satan and where he's going and the fall of man, both of them without Christ, is going to go to the place. When their na names are not written in the book of life, you go into the lake of fire. That is the final judgment. See the connection? What that warfare is all about under the human race is called the angelic conflict. And that's what we're going to study about today. We're going to look at this because this connection is enormous. For example, I'll do one more with you. Then I'm, I got to have word prayer. <clears throat> Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Let me make one more connection with you. <clears throat> and then we're going to pull all this together. I'm going to make one more connection. Go to... 1 Corinthians 15 with me, <clears throat> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop down to verse 45 for a moment to show you a connection. <clears throat> verse 45, about the human race, the, the connection between the fall of Satan and the fall of Adam. The fall of Satan led a, a one-third of the angelic beings <clears throat> in revolt against God, the fall of Adam left the human race in it. Here's verse 45. So it is written. Now, if you have a study Bible, you'll know that. <clears throat> so it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam. <clears throat> Do you know who the last Adam is? The life-giving spirit. <clears throat> That's Christ. The first Adam, and there's a last Adam. The last Adam is Jesus Christ. One, you have the fallen humanity, you have fallen humanity, and the other one, you have the redemption of it. Are you with me? Redemption is how you get in the book of life. If you're not there, you go to the lake of fire with the devil. You understand that? <clears throat> All right, now, let's look at one more passage in here. 22. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 22. <clears throat> Makes another connection. For in Adam, that's the first Adam, all die. He's talking about spiritually, all die. <clears throat> you remember when we read in Revelation that those who go to the lake of fire have a second spiritual death? You remember that? We, re we, we read it in Revelation 20. You're born without Christ. If you die without Christ, you go through a second spiritual death, which is separation from God, not in time, but in eternity, i.e. the lake of fire. That's why the gospel is so important. That's why the church must be evangelical. 
by the church, I mean you and me, why we need to be evangelical. <laughs> this is going to be how it plays down. This is, how it, this is the outcome. Just as sure as God made little green apples, this is the way it's going to fall. So in verse 22, for in Adam all die, in Adam all die. That's how we're born. We're born in Adam, spiritually dead, separated from God in time. So also in Christ, all are made alive. That's the opposite of death. Spiritual death is given over to spiritual life. How do I get from spiritual death? We're all born in Adam. Are you human? I don't, that's not how you act, how you was born. <laughs> If you're human, rather than vegetable, animal, or whatever, if you're human, then you were born in Adam. If you're born in Adam, you're born spiritually dead, separated from God in time. The only way you can get back is John 14, 6. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father God apart from me. And when you come to Christ through the gospel, that he died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead, when you come by faith, believing that that's the, that is how you get to be saved, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. When that occurs, then you're transferred from a position of death to a position of eternal life. By grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself, it is a gift. Now, the warfare between these two events is called the angelic conflict because the human race is all about, will you choose to follow God or the devil? And there's no other third person. Either you will follow him all the way to the lake of fire or you will stop along the way, accept Christ as your Savior and follow Christ to the third heaven because you have eternal life. So let's have a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer, priest, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit to come to realize this morning, as you said in this Bible study, that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You cannot learn it, nor can you live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. And for the Christian... It means that he needs to confess his sin to be restored to fellowship with the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit because that's what makes you a spiritual person. That's the living dynamics of the Christian life. And so you have to, 1 John says, 1 John 1, 9, you have to confess your sins. God is faithful and just to extend the work of Christ from the cross to the Christian life by confession of sin to restore you to fellowship. And that will be really important for this study today, that the Holy Spirit can teach you the truth. For it is the truth that sets you free from the cosmos diabolical system of lies that the devil promotes. And so, Father, we thank you for all of this today, for these that have come our way to study with us. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth. Truth, the truth and the absolute truth and nothing but the truth. So help us, God, that we get it today in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to look today at the victory in the angelic conflict. And I've got five points. I'll see how far I can get. The rest of it can take home. Uh, I will not be returning to this subject matter. So here we are, the origin. What is the origin of the angelic conflict or the fall of Satan? It occurs in eternity past before Ephesians 1 declares before the foundation of the earth or the world. The origin of the angelic conflict was in eternity past when the archangel Lucifer, the Latin word, led an angelic revolt with one-third of the angels revolting against the sovereign authority of God laid out in his plan in eternity past. Revelation 12.4, you recall we studied that last week. Where you find this information is Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, where we're told that Lucifer, Latin word, in the Hebrew, his name is the star 
the star of the he is the the star of the morning. He is the morning star. He is the star of the morning or the morning star. <clears throat> he is the son of dawn. When the Latin the, the Latin transliteration of that idea from the Hebrew is how you get the word Lucifer, the bright and shining one. It's a reference. That's a reference to Isaiah. It's a direct reference to this passage in Isaiah 14, 12. Ezekiel, the 28th chapter, 11 through 19, is a second reference we have, and it is here that you get a description of Lucifer in eternity past. What was this archangel like? What, 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 what did he have to lose? Ezekiel 28 shows you how much he lost from his creative order in his fall. It's just an interesting passage to study. Then in Revelation, the 12th chapter, the writer in Hebrew, uh, the writer of Revelation, John, as he begins to summarize the closing, that's why Revelation is the last book, is because John wrote about the closing of human history. It's the book of Revelation. And chapters 19, 20, then 21 and 22, the new heaven and new earth. And so Revelation uh, becomes... Genesis becomes the first book and Revelation becomes the last book, and rightly so. And it shows you the angelic conflict in its end day. And so when you put those three passages together, you get an enormous look at the angelic conflict that you and I struggle with every day. Listen to me. And in tense way, the church age, that you and I live in, there has never been a more intense conflict of the angelic conflict, more intense period of a period in biblical history than the period in which you and I live. No one, no one but no one will fight the warfare, spiritual warfare, the invisible war that you and I fight every day of our life. Nobody. Because the devil and the demonic world, the fallen angels, know their time is up. They know their time is up. They knew it as soon as the incarnation, when the Magi showed up and said, where is, the, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? They know they were in deep trouble. And he is an, adv an adversary, I mean a roaring lion seeking someone to devour adversary in the church age. Look. And you don't even know it. I mean, you don't even, you're not paying attention to it. And so this lesson today, I hope to rattle your cage. Look. Got health issues? You got marriage issues? You got work issues? Health issues? Money issues? Social issues? No one likes me issues? Got a whole lot of stuff going on in your life. Huh? Nobody can understand it. Seems like I'm, I'm in that. Listen, the worst thing you can do is get become battle fatigued. I, I say to you, you live in the most strenuous period ever of human history in the angelic conflict. You're not going to get through your life without enormous stress and pressure put on you because of your faith in Christ.
He will dissect your life. He will dissect your life. See, your life is like a circle. I say this all the time, peripatio. Your walk worthy of the Lord is based on a circle, and in that circle is your life divided up into all kinds of pieces of pie. You know what I'm saying? Okay, pizza, you know, you get a pizza and you... you okay. Now you feel better that it's not pie, it's pizza. Okay. He's going to fight you in every piece of that pie until he can find a piece of that pie that you're weakest in. And then he's going to camp out. Well, I don't know if you don't. If you're not interested in the Bible, well, then my message today is not going to be very encouraging to your heart because you need to read Ephesians, the sixth chapter. It says, put on the full armor of God because you're at war every day of your life. Put on that armor every minute. Wear that armor every minute of your life. <clears throat> you, know when you, you know when that armor should become the most important to you? When one of your close buddies just got nailed because he didn't wear it. And he fell. He f mortally fell in combat because he didn't wear his armor. That's when you put your bullet... That's when you begin to wear your bulletproof vest. You don't leave it in a car anymore. You don't leave it on, in the police car anymore. You wear it because your best buddy just got nailed by it. Are you, do you not understand why Paul told you to put on the full armor of God? Because you're, you're in the most, and nobody ever was, nobody, nobody in biblical history was ever told to do that. If you were told to put on armor, you fought a physical war. <laughs> I talk a little louder because you apparently weren't hearing me. The only place you'll ever read that we're in an invisible war and you need to wear your armor and your armor is all about the word of God is in the New Testament in the church age. All the rest of your armor is for physical warfare, not spiritual warfare. We're in the intensity. We're, we're, we're worried about North Korea, and we're worried about China, and we're worried about, listen, the church ought to be worried about the devil. We're in the greatest war of any war that's ever existed. The church of Jesus Christ, and we're in trouble today. We're in deep trouble because people don't want to wear the armor. They don't want to hear about warfare. They don't want to sing about they don't want to sing about onward Christian soldiers. They've taken it out of the hymn books. Are you aware of that? They don't want to hear about it. Church is the only one that has the message. Church is the only one that wears the armor. The church is the only one that's fighting the war. This is a war. He's declared war on the church. And God beat him on the cross. 1 John 3, 8, Jesus Christ beat him on the cross. There is victory over the angelic conflict. And don't you let it. Don't you lie. And he's got your life, buddy. If you go to this church, he's got your number. If you go to this church, he's got your number because this is where we fight the war. None of this lollipop and let's go home and sing la, 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 la. We're at war. Buddy, we're at war. Every day we're at war. And you know it when your marriage is under attack, and your physical is under attack, your business is under attack. And you know when it's good, as he says, it's bring it on. 
just bring it on because John 1, John 4, 4, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Just look him in the eye and tell him to bring it on. My victory is in Christ. It's not in myself. My victory is in Christ. My armor is in the word of God and my power is in the indwelling Holy Spirit and I can beat anything, anytime in my life. Got a guy sitting back here that's one of the greatest warriors I've ever met. The guy back there. Steve Chafin. Talk about a warrior. He looks him in the eye every day and says, go to where you're going. My daughter Deanna has a good friend that has fought the devil tooth and nail. I mean, how long, Deanna, has that girl fought this war? 11 years, and you should see what that woman has gone through. He has stripped her down to nothing in her humanity except her soul and her spirit. And she looks him in the eye every day and tells him to go where you know you're going, to the lake of fire. The human spirit, the human spirit, dear heart, the human spirit, the human spirit is the most powerful thing in the world when it's under the power of the word of God and the Holy Spirit. It's the most powerful thing in the whole world. We roll over and play dead when he just comes and barks at us. You don't give up your marriage. You don't give up your business. You don't give up your fight. You look him in the eye and tell him your victory is in Christ. We surrender the word of God. We surrender our pledge to Christ. I don't know about you, but I really got born again. I didn't get no religious fix. I got born again in 1961. I got born again. And I'm going to take the fight to that devil. I'm going to take the fight to him every day of my life, Horton. I'm going to take the fight to him every day of my life. You can't have my wife. You can't have my children. You can't have my grandchildren. I'll fight you every day of my life. Because I know where the victory is. I know where the strength is. I know where the wind is. The wind is in Christ. give him no space in my life. I give him no time in my life. I'm at war. I'm at war. I love God and I hate the devil. He's a big bag of wind. He's got no power. He has no power what you, except what you give him. He has none. Give him none. You don't give him any more than Job gave him. Let me tell you, I don't have half the courage that Steve Chafin has or Deanna's friend. He has stripped her from everything in her life but her humanity. And she will not give it up. She's taken everything from her. I mean everything. Except a God-loving warrior like Deanna. And though her parents and everybody else left her hanging dry, my daughter never left her. And we're going to hang with Steve Chafin, my dear buddy. We're going to hang with you because you're the real warrior.
You're the real warrior. I wear, I wear a, a parade suit. You wear your flesh. God bless you guys that understand the warfare and fight it. Understand the warfare and fight it. Do you know why 2 Corinthians 11, 4 is an important passage? It says that the devil can disguise himself as a what? A what? An angel of what? A light of what? An angel. An angel of light. No kidding. Guess where he got that idea? He's dumber than a brick. The devil don't have a wit of sense. No more than you without the word of God. Listen, the word of God is the genius of God. You want to have contain the genius of God? Read the Bible. He's dumber than a brick. The only, only time he gets smart is when he quotes the Bible. He, he disguises himself as an angel. Guess what he was in eternity past, dear heart? Guess what he was in eternity past? Of course he can disguise himself as an angel of light. But he's as dumb as a brick. I hate him. I guess you know that. I can say that because you're going to hell. He ain't got a wit's chance of being saved because he threw it away. You can see the confidence the devil had from his first victory in heaven in the Garden of Eden against Adam and Eve. In Genesis, the second chapter, verse 17, God said, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the day you eat and die, you will die. Do you understand that? Well, we're not sure we understand it. Well, do you understand if you eat it, you'll die? Yes? Well, then believe that. <laughs> you know, God don't make our life complicated. We do. Their life never got complicated until the devil got in and said, you don't really believe that you're going to die if you eat the apple. No, what, what happened to you, you'll be like God. If you go against the word of God, you'll be like God. Surely he will not put you to death. That loving God would put you to death. God used the word, surely I will, and he used it, surely he won't. He's a liar. He tries to deceive us as an angel of light, that he's got some kind of biblical information that would be good to us that stands in opposition to what God tells you. I mean, see how dumb he is? Except when he's working with us. <laughs> yeah, until he starts working with us, and then we go like, well, that's a good idea. <laughs> Why couldn't I have thought of that? Oh, my eyes will be open. I'll be like God. Oh, really? You're already like God, you dummy. He made you an image. Salim DeMuth. He made you an image according to the likeness of God. He won't open your eyes. He will shut them. <laughs> Jeez. I ain't going to get through this lesson either, am I? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I'm on a one-point lesson on this thing. <laughs> Listen, my job is not how much I give you. It's how much you learn. That's what I've learned over 45 years with you. We see his confidence again when he takes on Jesus Christ. He is bold. In Matthew, the fourth chapter, 1 through 11, when he takes on Jesus Christ to take him down, you know how he say, has to take him down? The same way he has to take you down. Now, listen to me. Don't miss this because I'm not going to get to all this lesson today, am I? <laughs> I'm not going to get there. <sighs> you know how he gets you? Listen to me. Volition. Free will. Because it is volition, free will, that makes you a free agent in the angelic conflict. Free will. Beware of the pastor that tells you you don't have such a thing as free will. 
Guess where that message came from? <laughs> come from the pit of hell. There would, no be, there would be no word called believe in the plan of salvation if it wasn't for volition. There would be the word work. <laughs> it's for sale. Salvation is for sale. Can I hear a bid? But it isn't. It's a gift. Not of works. It's a gift. Volition. He attacks Jesus Christ. You know why, he attack, why he's confident he can attack him? Because volition is a free agent in the angelic conflict. Volition. Free will. Volition. Makes you a free agent in the angelic conflict. And so he, get, he gives them ch three choices. He goes right down a scale because he is, he's studied them. And he goes... He knows what his life's about. And so he goes down, three pieces of pie, and so he, 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 he challenges them. Each time Jesus Christ has to use volition with the full armor of God to defeat him. This is a good reason why the word of God in the armament of, of Ephesians 6, why it's called the sword of the spirit, the word of the sword of the spirit. The Machaira. See, if you think, listen, <laughs> if he was confident, bold and confident to take Jesus Christ on, <laughs> because he thought he had his number, you better put your armor on. <laughs> You better, before you leave church today, it, it, you better put your armor on because he thinks he's got your number and mine. He walked up to the Son of God, he who was without sin. And was confident he could take him down. You know what Jesus did three times? Volitionally, he pulled a sword and quoted the word of God correctly to him. The first time should have been enough. But the devil, he's not easy, easily persuaded to leave the fight. You are. Uh, he just rattles and barks a little bit. Not roar, barks. You go, ah. what's he got you on? Huh? He got your marriage in trouble? Got your family in trouble? Got your work in trouble? Where's he got you? Where's he got you? What piece of the pie has he got a hold of? He messing with you. Messing with you. You running all over the place like a crazy person. Once you sit down and take the word of God, what's it? He messing with your marriage? You know how, this is, how simple this is? God hates divorce. Messing with you physically. You know what the answer is? Huh? God is greater than anything in my life. My life is not about my body and flesh. My life is about a born-again soul and spirit that loves God more than anything in this world. And I'm preparing myself to meet him in all of his glory. None of mine. In Revelation, the 12th chapter, verse 6, you probably forgot this from last week. It says he was thrown down to earth. Thrown down to earth. Thrown down to earth. You know what that means in human terms? 
in human terms or in angelic terms, that meant no more second chances. No more. Booted. Booted out of heaven. Won't be no more second chances. Th those days are over. Thrown down. No second chances. Matthew 25, 41. And he turned, he passed, he was judged. To the lake fire. After the fall of Satan, Luther, Lu Lucifer's name was changed. You'll never find him again. He will never be called that ever again in the Bible. Nor in eternity. Never. When he falls from heaven, his name is erased. The only place you can find it is in the Bible. You know, all the angels have names, don't you? You do know that, don't you? Like stars. Michael. You do know they all have names. That name will never be, that name will never be again spoken. Now his name, after the fall, his name is Satan, the devil, and the evil one. That's who we contend with. <laughs> wow, that's who we contend with. He's got no power over your life or what you give him. None. He's been destroyed. His power has been taken from him. And the power has been given to you in the person of the Holy Spirit. 1 John 4, 4. Well, I've run out of time. I've got point two, point three, point four, and point five. So I may have to go back and reconsider what I'm going to do with all that information. Well, we're in no hurry anyhow. Are we in any hurry? I, I, I'm, I mean in life. I know you're, hurry, you're in a hurry today because you got things to go and places to go and people to kiss, and that's a good thing. But look, as the church of Jesus Christ, we just wait for any second in a blinking of an eye, the Lord will return and we'll be caught up together with those who have gone before us. And we will forever be in his presence. What a glorious day that will be. And I believe that could happen at any time, even today before you get home for lunch. Some of you wives, that might be a good thing, right? Well, I didn't know what I was going to do anyhow, so that would be one out. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us victory in the angelic conflict. And the reason we've been studying that, Father, is because it's one of the nine things that we're supposed to remember when we take part in the cup of the Eucharist because of the blood of Christ. It was the blood of Jesus Christ that gave us victory over the angelic conflict. A conflict because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We are, we are not victims. We are victors. And even though he may have brought the fight to us today, we're going to take it back to him. We're going to give him the fight of, that he's not had in a long time. You're not going to come in here and take anybody hostage. We will fight you. We will fight you. We're not going to give you my, our marriages, our children, our grandchildren, our, our businesses and our work. We're not giving you any of it. And you will know that you have fought. You will know where the victory is because it is always in Christ. And so our Father, take this offering Give us the courage, Father, to be wise with it and stretch it as far as the ends of the earth to bring people to the gospel of Jesus Christ because the days are short. The days are short. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.